Hey friends, I hope you're having a great day. Today we are doing the winter Q&A, but before we get started, I do want to say thank you to everyone who did submit questions. Now, I did have a lot of questions, and so because of that, I was not able to get to all of them this time. So if you are someone who submitted multiple questions and you don't get an answer to all of them today, I do apologize in advance. There's always next time. Also, I'm having to record it on three separate occasions. So there will be another costume and scenery change partway through the program, but I hope you enjoy this winter Q&A. Let's go ahead and get to the first question. And that is, what is your longest backpacking trip to date? And have you considered an even longer one? My longest trip to date is still the Foothills Trail. That was one week, exactly seven days. And while I thoroughly enjoyed that experience and being out there for that whole week, that is kind of my limit uh, for how long a trip I'm willing to take. Really, I'm more of a micro adventure type. And so like three to four days is kind of that sweet spot. When you start getting into a week or more, that's when the trip kind of loses its enjoyment for me. So I'm not opposed to taking another week long trip in the future. It would just have to be something really special. Our next question is, how do you stay warm in the cold temperatures while on your hikes? Thankfully, during the day, while I'm moving and hauling a 20 pound pack, I stay pretty warm. Um, I do carry a pullover or a jacket in the front pocket of my pack at all times. So when I do stop to take breaks and I'm not, you know, expending that energy and generating that heat, I can put that on until I'm ready to start moving again. At camp, it is all about layering. And before I go into the details of this, I feel like I need to preface. The lowest I've ever camped at is in the 20s. I'm sure to the more experienced backpackers out there, that is not at all impressive. Um, but that, like my uh, time limit, that is my temperature limit for when the trip stops being enjoyable. When I get to camp, I'll change out of my hiking clothes and into my camp clothes, which is usually a wool base layer set, so leggings and a pullover. And I'll either wear a fleece or down jacket, usually not both. And then uh, that jacket that I keep in the pocket of my pack, that windbreaker, I'll put that on over top. Also, building a fire at camp is tremendously helpful. And uh, I do wear a hat, gloves, thick wool socks. So pretty much like all my camp clothes are those uh, cozy insulating layers. The other thing I layer is my sleep system. So I have a Enlightened Equipment down quilt. They say it's good to 10 degrees. It is not. It is more like 25 or 30 degrees. And so if it is lower than freezing, I will bring the ever popular Aegis Max down sleeping bag. That's like a budget summer bag. And I'll layer the two together and that will help keep me warm. This question was asked on a recent video. I got there okay to go ahead and use this as an opportunity to kind of expand on a few other hiking apps I use. And so the question is, what hiking app did you show in that video? So I was using Gaia GPS in that little clip. And that is my primary app when it comes to planning my route, and even on the trail navigation. That's like my number one. I know there's some mixed opinions. I haven't had any issues. It has always been like great performing for me. It's also super helpful with saving information like waypoints and pictures um, for when I write my itineraries and I can go back and look at those details. So it kind of serves multiple purposes for me. The other one that I will use for planning only and not on trail navigation is All Trails, AKA All Fails. Um, <laughs> All Trails is really good in my opinion for gathering intel about uh, water sources and campsites and important landmarks. Uh, you can look at reviews and get a general idea of current trail conditions. That being said, the reviews also are like a Facebook or YouTube comment section and can get pretty rough. 
Um, but if you kind of skim through that kind of stuff, there is usually some good information. And a major reason I don't use it for actual navigation is there have been several times when the mileage it has listed for a section of trail is way off. Uh, same thing for the tracking. The last two apps that I use are weather related and that kind of helps me to determine what to bring on the trip and what conditions to expect and that's Mountain Forecast and Open Summit. One uh, of them is usually a little bit off so it helps to have the other as like a second opinion. So that's kind of the list of apps and technology that I use when on a hike and planning a hike. So this gets asked at least once every new trip video and that is do you edit your own videos? Yes. And even if I did have someone I could hire to edit for me, I don't think I would want to hand that over. Sometimes though I will say it is like working with a separate person. So director Jessica on the trail has all of these super creative transition ideas and sequences of shots, but then it's up to editing Jessica sometime later to try to figure out what the heck it was I was trying to do and piece it all together coherently and hope it was close to the original vision. Uh, then other times director Jessica is just out of ideas and so I'll take a bunch of seemingly aimless shots and then editing Jessica comes in clutch and puts together this fantastic sequence from it and makes an otherwise really boring part of the video an attention grabber. In short, yes, I do edit my own videos and it is very time consuming. It takes around two months to finish a single video and that's to be expected since I'm trying to maintain and even increase the production value as just a one woman team but I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, where do you go when you have to poop and do you use toilet paper or a leaf? Uh, for folks who haven't been backpacking or been on a camping trip that does not have a pit toilet? This is a really big question. And first and foremost, have to go ahead and refer to the leave no trace seven principles. Pretty much go off trail 200 feet away from the nearest water source so you don't contaminate it. Uh, dig a hole, a cat hole that is six to eight inches with a trowel. Do your thing. Leave no trace recommends that you pack out your toilet paper uh, and then you will bury all of that and most people will take a rock or sticks and mark the spot to say like hey this has been used don't dig here now if you want to get really good at pooping in the woods you are gonna learn this trick then it has two applications what you're gonna want to do is find a loo with a view and like I said two applications so that can mean two things one you're going to dig your cat hole in a beautiful location. So you've got this just really nice overlook while you do your business. Uh, or two, you're gonna dig your cat hole in a place where you can see everyone at camp, but they can't see you. So you can kind of watch them while you do your business and they're none the wiser. Now, if you really wanna step it up a notch, you'll incorporate some of these techniques for while you go. There's the koala bear, the orangutan hang, and most impressive of all, the spread eagle. If you want full context for all of this, please go check out part five or day five of the Foothills Trail. That trail journal and video kind of explains. Two of my main fears about going hiking are one, fear of being alone in the woods, and possibly being attacked by a man, and two, fear of wild animals attacking me. Do you have any advice or thoughts on this topic? Thanks. So we're going to address these separately because they're kind of separate topics in my opinion. So we'll start with scary men in the woods. But first, I'd like to refer you to an excellent episode of Trust the Trail podcast. It's number 92, and in it, Scott and Ariane talk about just reasons why this is something you should not be as afraid of and Ariane kind of talks about her solo experiences 
and offers some comfort to females out there who are very worried about this issue. The more time I spend in the woods, the more I come to realize it is one of the safest places I can be. I have been nearly killed and sexually harassed more times in my local Walmart parking lot than on any trail. All of this being said, should you be alert and aware of your surroundings when you encounter other people? Absolutely. If something doesn't feel right, definitely trust your gut on it. If someone is weirding you out, don't stick around. If they set up camp with you, then pack up your stuff and move on. Don't be so worried about coming across as rude that you stay in a situation that your gut is telling you is wrong and then risk your own safety. You know, bear spray works on people too. And so does dog pepper spray. Carry that with you. Have it there on your hip belt. You can also go get your CWP. Of course, we are not going to get into just all the varying opinions on this topic and, you know, some restrictions that could apply in certain areas. Like, that is for everyone to do their own research on. But just know that that is an option, especially for women who want to feel safer in the backcountry. Dogs are great. Barrett can be really scary when he wants to be. So to summarize the very long answer to this part of the question, there are a lot of things that you can do to mitigate your risk of this if it's something that you are concerned about. Is it a possibility? Yes. But should it be something that keeps you awake at night and you're so scared of it keeps you from getting outside and enjoying the outdoors? No. I'm sure there's people that will disagree with me. We're all entitled to our opinion. That's my hot take on it. Now let's talk about wildlife. I love this topic of bears, specifically black bears. And I know you said wildlife, but we all know that you're talking about black bears. So first and foremost, gonna refer you to another great resource. The first is bear.org from the North American Bear Center and wiseaboutbears.org. These two sites are just such excellent resources for better understanding black bears and how to avoid encounters with them and then what to do if you do have an unwanted encounter with a bear. Just to put things in perspective, since 1900 there have been 67 people killed by black bears. Let's assume that since the article was published this may have gone up, we'll call it 75. Even then, statistically that's less than one person per year. Now take a look at the statistics for sharks. There were 47 unprovoked shark bites in 2021 alone and the year before that it was 33. So far more likely to be attacked by a shark on your family beach vacation than by a bear on a camping or backpacking trip. Also there are over a thousand traffic deaths per year in South Carolina alone. Now I will say venomous snakes and wild hogs, those are things I am a little bit more concerned about, but just like with any wildlife, there are things that you can do if you were to encounter one to reduce the risk of having a fatal encounter. And if it is something that really concerns you, really does worry you, then rather than just feeding off of that fear and letting it prevent you from actually getting outside and enjoying hiking, take it as an opportunity to learn more about, you know, what your options are, what you can do to, again, mitigate that risk, what you should do if you find yourself in this situation, just to kind of arm yourself with knowledge and do your research rather than dwelling on that fear and then letting it ruin what could be a really fun hobby for you. Do you carry an inReach with you when you hike? I started carrying a Garmin inReach Mini this year. Previously, I did not carry an inReach or any kind of satellite communicator uh, just because I didn't feel that it was necessary. Uh, but as I started going on longer, more challenging hikes into more remote places, I realized that it was something I should invest in. And so far, the year that I have been using it, 
I'm very glad that I made that investment. Yes, I do carry an inReach and for me, I've felt like it has been worth it, but it's up to everybody to decide, you know, whether or not investing, because it is a pretty big investment, it's up to individuals to decide if that is something they think will work for them. I didn't think it would be something that would work for me, so I held off a really long time on doing it, but now that I have, I, I'm glad that I did. Our next question is, what kind of shoes and socks should I wear when I first begin hiking? I heard new shoes could hurt your feet. So I will tell you what I tell friends who want to join me for like a day hike that really don't have a lot of experience yet hiking. And that is wear whatever is already comfortable for you. So if you have a pair of closed toed shoes, like sneakers, tennis shoes, whatever, running shoes that are already broken in, and are comfortable for you, like you know you can do uh, athletic activity in it, whatever it is, just wear those. Don't, you know, the day before the hike, run out and buy bulky leather hiking boots. Just wear what already is comfortable for you. That is my humble, unprofessional opinion. The thing is, most hikers now are gravitating away from the traditional hiking boot and going with trail runners. I wear barefoot shoes. Those are not for everybody. What, do you want me to throw this for you? Once you get more experience hiking, then yeah, look into what kind of hiking shoes you want to get if you specifically want to buy shoes for that activity. The second part of your question with socks, the general consensus is cotton kills. So I like to wear merino wool socks, but that's not your only option. I know plenty of other folks who they only wear synthetic fibers for their socks. So like nylon, polyester, spandex, like that works great for them. So cotton, kind of a no-no. It's gonna make it a really unpleasant experience. It's a blister maker. This question is a recurring character. It gets asked all the time. And in fact, I answered it on the last Q and A. That is, do you ever plan to hike all of the AT? And my answer is still the same, no. I have no desire to, intention of ever hiking the whole Appalachian Trail, whether that is a through hike or a section hike done over years, that is not something I aspire to and I am more than okay with that. Micro adventures, that is my thing. I love the micro adventures, so taking multiple months to complete a hike if I did a through hike that's out I would not enjoy that same thing with section hikes I just I really do not like to travel far from home so flying out or road tripping out to do the northernmost sections that is not something I would enjoy doing either just I'm so okay with never completing the Appalachian Trail. This question has to do with gear. What is your favorite hiking gear? So I am currently working on a video and blog post for my like top 10 staple gear items. These are items that are like the tried and true pieces from over the years that go with me on majority of my trips. And so I will give you the full rundown of just those top 10 items in that video. But in the meantime, I'll go ahead and tell you about a kind of gear item gadget that I'm really enjoying lately. And that is the Big Agnes Mountain Glow lights. I've taken that on a couple trips now and I've just really loved having the cute ambient light that hooks perfectly into my Fly Creek tent. And uh, I mentioned in the last Q&A from, you know, some time ago, my favorite gadget gear item was this little travel pump. I still use that from time to time, but now my favorite little gear gadget is these mountain glow lights. I love that you can put them in the little carry bag, and kind of hang that from uh, the ceiling in your tent or you can take the lights out and clip it inside of the tent. So that's what I'm loving right now in terms of just a little fun gear item that I've added to most recent trips. All right, that concludes our Q&A video. 
thank you again to everyone who did submit questions and again I do apologize if I didn't get to all of them this time and uh, thank you in advance for your grace with that. It's been an interesting start to the year, just so many things going on in life off trail and it has made it so that I have to record this on multiple occasions and even release the video weeks after when I intend to, but that's a whole other thing. I thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I can't wait to see you again next time. Trace in my footsteps through the wind Back to a place where I could begin Where do I go? Where do I go? And if we carry on, my friends We can make it to the end I just don't Maybe you just don't go hiking. No, that's not an option.